Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot, Managing Director and Head of Research here at Red Cloud Securities. I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We are going to hear from Fission 3.0 management, including Deb Rando, Randua, Randawas. I apologize, Deb, I've only been saying that for 13 years. So, Chairman and CEO, and uh, Ray Ashley, VP Exploration. Uh, during today's webinar, they will provide an overview and outlook, and then we will take questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, first we need to discuss the fine print. During this Fission 3.0 webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I would direct listeners to the to their forward-looking statements outlined on page two of the corporate presentation. That can be found on the company's website, fission3corp.com. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors, and participants should really rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. So please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Fission 3.0. Now, before Deb and Ray step up, I would like to say a few words. You know, very positive news for the uranium sector was announced a couple weeks ago. Sprott Physical Uranium Trust increased its base shelf prospectus to $3.5 billion, billion US. So what that means is after raising $1.3 billion already this year, it now has permission to nearly triple that amount. And we expect the company to continue to add to its 40 million pounds or $1.8 billion worth of uranium. So we do see potential for Spot to raise these further funds as good news, but you know we still wait, await for an increase in long-term contracting to support uranium prices on a sustainable basis. We would still love uranium demand to be driven by the end user buying as nuclear utilities use 177 million pounds, <clears throat> excuse me, million pounds of uranium annually. That said, one cannot ignore the physical, the impact physical buying has had on the sector and on uranium prices in 2013. The original 300 million equity raised by Sprott helped drive prices from 30 to 40 dollars. The following billion dollar raise helped increase to the 46 to 47 dollar range. Now that they uh, have permission to raise another 2.2 billion. Should they go ahead, we expect more uranium purchase to, purchases to be made, and that could propel uranium prices above 50 bucks a pound, and perhaps close to those incentive prices needed by the uranium developers and explorers. Now, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Deb and Ray to update the audience on Fission 3.0. Gentlemen. Well, thank you, David. Um, yeah, absolutely. What uh, Mr. Groskopf's done single-handedly uh, changed our industry. And um, I've been um, talking the atomic energy story for some time since 1998 about the deficit. But this is the first time since in those years that I've been able to talk about how I'm no longer fighting the greenies. They're on my team or I'm on their team. Because I think what the bigger story obviously is, is that, you know, people are realizing that we can't meet these lofty goals of zero emissions or the different um, spins people using out there. If we want to reduce our footprint, how do we get there without polluting more with all the given growth we have? So finally, nuclear is part of that discussion. Um, countries are doing it and et cetera. And so, um, you know, the this is what the reactor situation looks like. And I, and I point that out because there's 440 now, there's 56 more being built, but the Chinese announced 150 more. Having done some business in China and with them as a partner, I can tell you they're quite serious about it. Um, so that, that's quite the number of reactors they plan to have. And we'll, when the, it doesn't talk about SMRs, it doesn't talk about, you know, th that to me is a real game changer. I think um, there's two actually floating on uh, boats now with Russia. Um, they're very similar to the SMRs we think of, but I do believe you're going to see more and more of that. Um, I think Rolls Royce, as you know, raised a whole bunch of money with some from very, very smart people um, who are saying, look, we're not going to get to our goals 
ESG goals, we don't have nuclear. So a lot of you know that, and but I just want to point that out. Um, you know, it, like I said, I've never I've never stood in front of an audience before in the last 25 years to talk about uranium and say, oh, you know, um, the United Nations is now making it, saying it's got to be front and center of it. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, you know, it's what Sprott's doing to drive the price. And, um, you know, I... I got my start with Strathmore with Rick Rule financing us. And then um, Eric Sprott invested in us, but it was really Peter Groskopf who was our banker. So I've known these individuals for some time, and they're not just into uranium now. They have a firm belief in that we can't get where we're going, um, you know, without having nuclear power. Uh, as I mentioned, I've been doing this since 1996. Bottom line is, if you bought a share in 2007 of Strathmore Minerals, you looked in your account today, you would have very four very active stocks in your account. You would have Denison, you would have Energy Fuels, you would have Fission Uranium, and Fission 3.0. Now, that's pretty unheard of, uh, I think, in any field. But we've been blessed with very smart people, uh, good partners, um, and timing. You, you've got to have timing. Um, Strathmore, I started in a basement and um, up and downs, but eventually in 2004 and five, Sumitomo became a partner to develop the uh, Roka Honda. Um, at the peak of the market, 2007, Peter Groskopf said, you're not getting any love for your Canadian assets. Why don't we spend them out in fission energy? And I said, great. So, that became Fission Energy, and eventually Strathmore was sold to Energy Fuels. Within Fission Energy, we attracted a Korean electric power company, a Korean utility. They put up all the money. We try to use the old adage that Rick Rules said before, it's our mind, our properties, other people's money. So they put up all the hard money in a very difficult time. If you remember what you know, 2008, 9, and 10 were like, well, thankfully, KEPCO kept funding the project on the Waterbury. We, we hit discovered and eventually we sold that to Denison. Um, we had put up very little money, but, and then we took what was on the, on the west side of the basin. We had hit a hole already. We knew something was there and that became Fission Uranium Corp. Um, because of merger with Alpha, we spun out all the exploration assets into Fission 3.0 and that's who we are today, Fission 3.0. There's a, a, these assets have been around for a bit with different markets, you don't you know, raise so much money and drill, but we've got, a, we're asset rich and slowly we're becoming more, more and more cash to explore these. Um, so we're a project generator model. We have 14 projects. One, we, we don't number we really like and we're drill ready, but uh, we're going to focus on three today. Um, otherwise, the presentation will go too long. And so um, we've 14 projects. We're going to focus on ourselves drilling one, and we have a joint venture for the other one. Um, this tells you why when, you know, those who are not familiar with the Athabasca, it's a no-brainer. To me, if you can't be in Kazakhstan where, you know, your costs are below 10, most cash costs are under 20 in the Athabasca because it's of the grade. And also you have a permitting process that's, that's long and lengthy, but you know which way you have to go. So it's a great place to do business. You've got mills, you've got rules, um, and most of all, the grade. Anybody that's been in the mining will tell you grade is king. You can, if the grade's not there, it, it gets, it, it gets tossy. So um, we've got the grades in Athabasca. We love it, and that's where we are. Um, we, our strength is our is our people and their ability to buy assets when no one is looking. And that's the idea of, to take advantage of a bear market is to be able to buy land nobody else is looking at. Ray is one of 12 people in our crew. Um, they're outstanding people. They've been with us since 2010, many of them, and right the way through. So I would say that's definitely our number one strength. Number two is that these acreages, you, I don't know if you can see it on this, but you can see all the green dots and the uh, you'll see a lot of assets actually outside the basin. Um, and that's interesting, and I'll get to that why. 
but we have assets throughout the basin for particular geological reasons. Um, so we have a strong technical team and we used a very unique approach. <coughs> um, those are familiar with the basin. There was a time, I know a friend of mine were from Camelco and said, if they ever talked about being on the west side of the basin, they're almost kicked out of the room. Because the rule was, if you're gonna find a high grade mine, you've gotta be on the east side of the basin, you've gotta be deeper, and it's gotta be what they call unconformity deposit. And that's just a fancy word for when you've got sandstone hitting the basement rock, that contact point they call the unconformity. So Cigar Lake, MacArthur, that's what you have there. And our discovery of Waterbury was like that. Um, and that's what everybody looked for. And I think those of you who follow sports know the same thing. If a team wins with you know, a three-point offense in basketball, every team copies that if they win the championship. So same thing here. Everybody copied that. But you know what? David can't beat Goliath unless you've got an advantage. In our case, it was people who worked in the diamond field um, understood that there's a different way of um, looking at a large amount of land very quickly. Instead of, you know, um, uh, I was telling people, my friends in the UK, like half the basket is twice the size of England. Well, you can't have people, it would take you a million years if you have people going along and trying to look for rocks through the entire basin. So what we did was something different. These are our projects, and just give you a better idea of where they are. They're north, west, east, but they're all generally around the edges because we're looking for shallow, shallow targets, both for discovery and mining. Um, and by the way, why are we looking at discoveries? Well, they matter. If you look at these next gen and some of the stocks in a, in a bull market, you can see the huge rise. So even if you say, hey, I love uranium, I'd encourage you to own um, the Sprott Fund or Yellow Cake physical funds, have a development one, and have some expiration in your, uh, in your um, basket because ba these junior expiration ones, we make a drill hole, they can, you know, five, ten times your money, whereas something that's being developed will only move up and down with the price of uranium generally unless they make it as good. So discoveries are... An important part. In fact, we need at least one more cigar lake a year if we're going to meet the deficit going forward. So these charts tell you the impact of discoveries versus simply investing in a chemical or a developer. They only go up and down generally with the price of uranium. Now, I want to get to this because it's very important. Um, how did we find uh, in the fission management team, which is fission uranium, but we're together in fission 3.0 technical, how and why did we go over to the West? I mean, why would you not look for unconformity? Why would you look for something on the edges or in the old? We, what we believed, what was the basin before, is looks like this, but it was bigger. And so, and so we kept looking for, in the, in the, Diamond business, they were looking for garnets and those kind of indicator minerals. So Dr. Stu Blossom and Chuck Fipke used choppers to try to find those indicator minerals. And then they found the kimberlite. Well, similar to here. So um, I'm going to turn this over a little bit here. Maybe um, you can explain a bit how this, why we use this technology and how it led to triple R, et cetera, Ray. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the picture in the picture who you see is a fellow by the name of Kai Hedin. And it's interesting that you mentioned the diamond, the diamond days, because the idea, Kai Hedin is a, a really smart geophysicist and actually designed and built an airborne mag spectrometer system that he uh, installed in that aircraft be, that's behind him. It's a Cessna with stall stall uh, aircraft that flies really slow. He designed a spectrometer that measures potassium, uranium, and thorium. And it, 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 he flies that system 10, about 10 meters above the ground. And the reason he 10 meters above the ground at treetop level, and he does that safely. The reason he does it is because he designed a system that could detect from the air a radioactive boulder on the surface of the ground or, or, or buried not too deep below the surface of the ground. His, 
He designed and built that system himself. It was on actually Stu Blesson is who gave him the idea to design and build it. And we flew it when we first, uh, Ross and I got wind of this property. It seemed an obvious thing to try because there was historic radon anomalies that had been found here and not followed up. And we went ahead and had Kai fly that survey. And what he detected is spikes. If a conventional radiometric system had been flown over that, you don't detect the boulders that were there. There was an average of 125 pitch blend boulders that were discovered on the, on the surface and shallow by that airborne system, 125 boulders with an average of 10% uranium. Once that was, and it's that airborne system that found that. Once that was discovered, it was then a matter of doing the follow-up work that eventually, and it didn't take long, led us to the discovery. So that's what yeah. that airborne system achieves. And, and that's key. So the question is like, you know, without this, there's no triple R and there's no next gen arrow. There isn't because everybody was, didn't believe in these kind of basement type deposits. So that just took, you know, ingenuity looking in a black box for some people we didn't think it was. And that's how this led to triple R. Now, why does that matter? Because this is how we worked. Um, this is how we, um, um, found these projects here. Um, all of these projects were different ideas that we've had, and we were looking for outcrops of uranium or boulders. So this technology led us to fly as much as we could, and plus areas that had different reasons. And there are still some projects that we've got that are more like the unconformity model, and we'll show you that in a second. But that's the technology that led to discovery of Triple R, which led to obviously our neighbors next door drilling arrow. Um, yeah. So we have three projects that we are going to be drilling uh, in the next eight months. Um, PLN and Lazy Edgewood we will do this winter. Um, and next summer we will do um, Lazy Edward. So Hart, sorry, Hardy Bay and PLN will do this winter and Lazy Edward later. Um, this is PLN. And no, it may be hard to see in the main slide, but if you can see, um, you can, I'll see if I can try to be clever for a second. Um, you can see this area, right? And that's the, um, that area is strictly the arrow, the Spitfire, and you can see how small this area is and compared to that size of this property. So it's a very large property. We spent a lot of money flying it. And we had started drilling it with Azengor as our partner, and then they ran out of money, and we've got the property back 100%. So we're going to be spending about you know about four million dollars next year on a number of this. So, Memory Ray, you can touch on a couple of our targets, why we like them, and then we'll talk about the other two. Absolutely, uh, PLN is our our most advanced property. We've been uh, working here since. Uh, 2014, I think it is. So, you know, all of the airborne geophysics has been flown over the property to define the conductors, which are the reactivated structures along which the uranium deposits are known to occur. So all of that work's been done. There's been follow-up ground geophysics done. So a lot of the work that has to be done before drilling has been completed here. So it's an advance, it's in that sense that it's advanced. If I tell you some of the main targets um, to, in the west part of the property, that's what's called, I actually can go to the next slide. Well, before I go to the next slide, what's interesting is where's the property located? It's located between the Patterson Lake corridor. Everything's northeast trending there, and then it switches to be north-south trending. So it's, it's between Errol and Triple R, not far, seven kilometers to the south. And then to the north, there's the Shea Creek and Clough, past producing Clough Lake Mine. So it's, it's, the location is ideal, surrounded by uranium deposits. If, if what else is interesting is that there's a trend that's parallel to the Patterson Lake corridor at the south part of the property, and then another north-south trend. If I just go to the next slide, I can tell you some of the main targets. Uh, the one in the, 
that's a little inset map is a zoom in. You can see what's described as the A1 conductor. There was 10 holes drilled there in 2014 and another six in 2019. We've already demonstrated that that, that conductor has uh, all of the hallmarks for the signs for a proximal uranium deposit. There's anomalous uranium that was intersected in those drill holes, anomalous path, pathfinder elements, um, nickel, cobalt, uh, boron, and intense alteration in the basement and in the lower sandstone. It's not deep there, 100 meters of sandstone. All the right signs that, you know, sniffs of uranium, 1450 uh, counts over seven and a half meter, meters. There's the north end of that conductor, everything that the alter, as we vectored in the alteration and the geochemistry got better to the north. And you can see that there was a lot of holes concentrated around that PLN 1419. The northern 800 meters of that conductor is untested and everything was getting better towards the north. So that's really a prime target. The, the Broach Lake conductors there in the south part of the property, never tested by drilling, but, but, all, but drill ready. That's parallel to the Patterson Lake corridor. That's seven kilometers to the south. That's why I really like that trend. You know, look, I, I'm excited to see what the drilling will show there. The ground geophysics has been done, DC resistivity, uh, ground EM. So the targets are really properly defined for us to go ahead and drill them. Uh, at the north part of the property is a is a really interesting target called over the end conductor complex. That's a kilometer wide zone of multiple conductors, which indicates to us a wide shear zone. And that's really the Patterson Lake corridor is a very similar, very wide shear zone. That's what it looks like. And what's interesting is resist, DC resistivity work there defined an alteration zone in the bottom of the sandstone, in the lower part of the sandstone. And that we interpret comes from clay alteration and increased porosity in the lower sandstone. It's a classic signature that's been seen elsewhere yeah. uh, above uranium deposits. Yeah. The end exactly. conductors is ready to drill. So these are yeah. some of the yeah. great targets that we're going to be drilling this summer and next winter. This Thanks, winter Ray. and next summer. Um, we signed a joint venture with Traction. They're friends of Sprott. Um, basically, you know, um, they wanted to drill, so they've got two projects from us um, that they're going to drill in the winter. It'll be Hardy Bay up north, and then down here it will be Lazy Edward. Essentially, again, we can't have enough money to delude ourselves too much if we try to drill all our own money. And so these joint ventures, they fund it. They're a good group of people. We get some cash, about 600 grand. We also get 15% um, uh, of the company. Um, and we run the program, so there's a bit of money in that as well. Pardon my phone, I'll, I'll run and get it. Um, so we'll start with um, uh, Hardy Bay, and this looks a lot like PLS, and I know Dave Talbot likes it with the boulders. Um, maybe you can talk, Ray, while we're going to drill it. I'll get the phone. <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, well, what Hardy Bay is, is on that uh, the island called Il Brochet. Uranium boulder trains were discovered on that island. Uh, High-grade high uranium boulders up to 3%. Historically, we went back to that island and found actually uh, several other uraniferous boulders, so we've confirmed them. And up, to, I think one of them was 8% uh, uranium. So it's, as Dev said, the analogy is, is there to what was this what was the boulder field that was found by fission uranium corp at, at, that led to triple r so what we did to follow that up um a lot of work was done in 2019 um so we confirmed that the ice direction this the the, so the the source area is to the northeast um historically they found uh, radioactive boulders that big black dot that's on the map uh, and on the lake bottom. And we used, uh, it's the same fellow actually who designed that airborne system. He he went there with the spectrometer in a, in a canister that he lowered from a barge. And he, we, he re, we re, 
rediscovered and extended that uranium boulders on the lake bottom. So we've confirmed all that historic work. We think they were on the right track. SO, El Dorado did a lot of drilling in, in the late 70s, uh, but th we think they just didn't go far enough. So a uh, uh, high resolution seismic survey was done by special projects in the lake. And what we were looking for was fault intersections up ice from those, that, those boulder trains. Uh, it was high resolution marine data with 50 meter spaced lines and it's generated 15 targets. They're, they're, they're really fault intersections immediately up ice from the boulder trains in, in the area where we think the source of those boulders is from. And so there's a plan for us to, we're gonna start thickening the ice uh, any day now. We start building ice, clearing the ice so that it's thick enough to put the drills on the ice. And there's a plan to drill those 15 seismic targets uh, and at, this, at, at the end of the winter. So that, that's the plan at Hardy Bay, the targets are defined. And uh, you know we hope to find the source of those boulder trains. Um, now, maybe you could just jump to Lazy Edward. Um, Lazy Edward's, um, as I mentioned, um, it's different. We're not looking for basement hosted, but the, um, so Lazy Edward will be drilled next summer. Maybe a quick, because we want to leave some time for questions, uh, why we like it and um, what what's the approach uh, to find something there, Ray? Yeah, I can do it. This property was actually staked by us mining the assessment files, the, the data that people file from previous exploration work. And Uranets did work here in the late 80s. And that's the work that we reviewed and got. It's a lot of work. Pulled all these available files out of the assessment reports and scoured through that. And what we saw was some clear targets that to us demand immediate follow-up. All the right signs are there uh, for, for there to be a uranium deposit, proximal uranium deposit. There's... It, and what's interesting too is it's on near the edge of the basin. There's only there's a hundred meters, about a hundred meters of sandstone and less, which means that the drill holes are shallow. So we'll get a lot of drilling for for the money, our money here. But there's some clear targets where there's bleaching and broken sandstone structures in the bottom of the sandstone. There's intense clay alteration in the basement. The rocks are tectonized. There's 170 ppm uranium in some of these holes. There's not many holes, like the horse conductor on the west side of that property is 3.3 kilometers long. It's only been tested with five holes and they're obvious follow-up holes. We've been now compiling the rest of the historic work most recently, and that's in anticipation. So if some drill holes are ready to go, that's in anticipation of some follow-up ground geophysics to, to refine these drill holes and uh, we're ready to be, to be doing a drill hole next summer. Sure. The, the geologists, are, some of them are more excited about what they see here. It, yeah. it speaks exactly to what we saw before the J-Zone discovery. It's exactly how the rocks looked just before the J-Zone J -Zone discovery. Okay, thank you. So it kind of summarizes our, our company. Um, we've, uh, like I said, technically, um, you know, Ross is uh, focused on fission rain developing it. So Ray's taking it, and uh, Ross is there to help. Um, we have the same 12 people, so we're excited about that. There's our share structure um, and who our, our team is. So I want to leave um, some time for questions. And, uh, um, um, and so uh, there's a couple of questions there. David, is there anything that you want to ask before I jump into a question from Robert? Hey, Deb. Yeah, I've got those questions in my uh, in, in my list. So why don't we uh, why don't we get going there if you guys are wrapped up? Sure. Well, I got one question is what's holding the share price? Um, I'm not a stockbroker, so I don't give advice. Um, but I think I have some would argue the opposite that, you know, we raised some financing this year, five, some at 10. And it was really the the problem is the price. We do have a lot of shares out uh, because this is a uh, a company that's been around, some of these shares have been around for 25 years. Um, and I would say the recent correction, but you know, today was a good day. I, I felt we were up a little bit compared to most. Um, and 
but we do have a lot of shares out. That on one hand provides liquidity, on the other hand it, it doesn't make the big jumps that if you only had, you know, like traction uranium is trading at 90 cents, but they don't have very many shares out. So that's always the dilemma um, at any time. We are certainly giving consideration rolling it back. Uh, that's on the table. But right now, uh, we're pretty happy actually at 24 cents because we were struggling at uh, below 10 cents uh, before this summer. So that's this. Other question is, is it early fission or ISO energy? Um, I, I guess Ray might want to talk about, you know, in terms of um, we have a lot of projects, 14 of them. I would say we're asset rich, um, so different from others. Uh, you know, maybe the question is, is, you know, what are we looking for? We're looking for ICO type of discovery or a triple R. I would say both. I think we're fortunate to have, um, like we just talked about, Lazy Edward will be a um, more of an unconformity kind of discovery if we make it. And if we find something up in uh, Hardy Bay, it would be more of a, um, a basement hosted. So um, I'm thankful that our technical team has experience with both. Um, the, the Waterbury J zone was an, a typical unconforming deposit discovery and triple R was a basement hosted. So I would say that we had the advantage that with these projects, uh, our team is capable of handling both. That's what I would say. That's a good answer. Good. Okay. Thank you, Dev. Um, no, appreciate the uh, presentation guys today. So why don't, why don't we, get into a few more questions here. Dev, you have spent a lot of time in China, uh, you know, have dealt with the uh, uh, with the uh, nuclear industry over there. Could you give us an idea of how they view the supply demand picture? You know, do you believe the Chinese will continue to go out and acquire uranium projects globally? Um, I think they get a lot of the uranium. Oh, absolutely. They're very focused. Those have never been you know, really should go there. It'll give you a bit more compassion for this, to, to put it bluntly, pollute or perish, right? Um, it's easy for us in Canada to have hydro and all these different options. They don't have that. And they've got it at the same time, they see the pollution. Those of you who've been to Beijing know that you can barely see across one building to another because of the pollution. They clean their act up for uh, Olympics, but then they turn the coal plants back on they're still cranking out coal plants every month because their demand for energy is growing when you got that many people. So I think, you know, they are somewhat ready. Um, but because I, if, if anybody is, have a plan, has a planned economy, it's them. So my guess is, as you saw, a recent investment of 430 million, I think, uh, CGN did with Kazakhstan. Um, so that was a pretty big investment before uh, uranium ran up. So they're quite committed to, to 150 reactors. Um, I can't say the same about your, uh, the, our North American friends. I think they're far more short-term thinking. Um, I always said when the Japanese left the market and they were dumping uranium, you know, rather than buying it, the adult left the, the, the playground um, because... Japan would not only plan three, five, ten years ahead, they were actually investing into deposits all over the basin. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, they were quite, uh, as you say, uh, planning way ahead. So I, I, I commend them for that. Uh, but I do think in talking to the notes I've seen by Felix Wang and some of the others, I think they're, they're much better shape, I think, than the North Americans. North American companies don't like holding uranium on their books because it costs money and it's much more quarterly driven versus you know uh, uh, I do believe that the Chinese government thinks uh, 5 to 10 15 years ahead that's the little I know without disclosing things right. I've been told in private okay thanks Dev maybe could you discuss your strategy about being a project generator you know I do do you guys plan to try to add value to all your projects through the drill bit before spinning them out to other partners? Oh, absolutely. They've got to be drill ready for the most part, I think, David. I think people who are, you, you know, look, you know what the concern everybody has? It's another blip. 
you know, and people are concerned it's another a boy who cried wolf. And we've seen lots of blip in uranium and then back down again. So I think that's what scares a lot of people. So as a result, when they come for joint ventureship, they want to drill, they want to find something and get going. So our goal is we have enough money now to drill the other two. This is our money. We might raise more. Uh, if that's the case, we'll use that money, David, to uh, move them up the food chain, I would say. Um, you know, we need to do some work. We need to understand it better before we go to a joint venture partner and say, hey, you should drill here. Well, we got to have some good business reasons for doing so. And we try to run our joint ventures like we would run our own project. We don't have two set of books. If we did this, we would do this. And this is for somebody else. No, we have one set of books. And so if we give, if we give, you know, traction a, uh, here, here's the business plan. It's the same business plan we would use. Um, vectoring, it, it's hard for, as a non, I'm not technical, but I, what I do know is that vectoring in, doing the various things we do before we drill is inexpensive compared to one drill hole. Uh, you can do a lot of work, what it costs for one drill hole to find out, you know, starting with a basic thing of finding conductors, you know, uh, cracks in the earth, and from there determine there's alteration. And if we do some work, we find some bleaching and uh, et cetera. So from there we alter in. Um, so I would say we want to slowly move up all these projects so they're drill ready. Um, we might, if we have more money, we might drill two more. But right now, you'll see seven and a half million spent next year just on drilling alone not including any more money that comes in. Because we have two more projects that are, that's the other thing. If somebody goes to do this tomorrow, they gotta find land. They've gotta have a team that understands what they have. You need drill permits, which is hard to get. And yeah. more, even harder to get are drill rigs. So we're fortunate to know our properties, um, have permits and have um, drill rigs. You know, when we, and we also, when it comes to ESG matters, you know, our guys working close with the Clearwater Group, uh, Chief Clark is, I think, a, has done fantastic. He's been with us uh, since 2008, 9, and 10, uh, when we first made our discoveries there. Um, we go out of our way to be good citizens, not because we're told to before somebody told us. It's the right thing to do. I grew up in a small town, with, and it was nothing drives people crazy when you know, hundred million dollars been spent on a mine and nothing is done for the community, right? I think no, nobody wants that. We don't need someone telling us that. That's the right thing to do. So I feel we've got the team that knows how to make discoveries, um, permits, drill rigs, and the right attitude towards First Nation issues. Great, thank you, Deb. I appreciate your comments on this. If I could just add something there. It's, you know, to, to what Deb just said is, Many of those projects that you see that we didn't mention right now, they're not at the drill ready stage, but there are plans in place to, and it has to be looked at carefully. And it has been plans in place to do the work Deb talks about, the ground geophysical work, which really is going to define drill targets. So that all of, there's a lot of projects that aren't ready now to drill at the drill stage that are being advanced. And that's ongoing in the background. There's going to be ground geophysics done this winter and as well in the spring, and that stands to bring many of those other projects to their drill stage, even by the even by next summer. Yeah, the questions popped up is about the drill rigs. We subcontract out. Um, Bryson Drilling kind of grew up with us. Um, they had one rig, one or two rigs, and they've grown with us. And we're thankful that we have access to those things. The prices don't go like this based on this. They're very good people. They do a great job. Um, so, but we subcontract that out. It's, a, it's quite expensive to own rigs and run them, plus have the expertise to run them. Great. Thank you, Deb. I hope that helps, John Kennedy. Yeah. Now, Deb, does Vision 3.0 only focus on exploration projects around the fringes of the basin or, or and specifically then targeting the west side of the basin? Ray, how would you say we put together our portfolio? No, we really are looking at the entire basin and uh, and it's you know, we tend to be, a lot of the projects tend to be near the edge or right outside, but we don't really restrict ourselves to that. We, you know, that's maybe, that's where the opportunities were because people were not focused there at all. Because as Dev said, they just, it's, it was the common knowledge was, that's not where you're going to find a uranium deposit. Now, you know, 
whatever. So that was where we focused for that reason. Today, we look at the entire basin. And if you look at our portfolio, it's really, it's everywhere in the basin. Yeah. Okay. And I heard you mention the grade is king, obviously why a lot of companies come to the Athabasca. Would you consider looking for projects or uranium anywhere else? Would you consider none of it or Labrador or U.S. or elsewhere? I looked at it. You know, obviously I've spoken to Dale and the guys, um, you know, and I know, um, but the grades aren't there, um, you know, in those places and plus infrastructure is very tough, none of it. Um, you know, it doesn't mean at hundred dollars uranium, they you know, Mr. Patterson and Dale would, won't do well. And also a uh, Rano's up there, you know, I'm not saying it won't. Um, I think that, um, some of the deposits, the Michelin, they have opportunities if uranium gets to where it can. Um, but, you know, and I do tell you, this is feels different, David, than any uranium market we've ever had, you know, um, we did not have the United Nations. We didn't have countries. Um, eight countries went to Brussels and says, hey, you've got to you got to include nuclear. We cannot meet our goals. Right. Emissions have actually gone up in Canada, despite, you know, uh, Mr. Trudeau's efforts. Our emissions have gone up. Japan has gone up. You know, how, so they got to stop talking about, you know, zero 2050 emissions or I mean, crypto. It, two years ago, they were using more energy than the country of Morocco, the 50th largest in the world. If 10% of Canadians were to buy electric cars, there's no way our system can handle it. So I think it's a reality check and people saying we've got to have that mix. Now, we're blessed in Canada to have hydro. But guess what? Japan, Korea, China, they don't have a lot of that. So I believe for the first time there's a fundamental change in the winds behind us. Um, which has led, that's why, why is Peter Groskopf able to raise that kind of money? Because people are looking for a home. And, um, and remember the last leg of uranium bull market's always the biggest. So I think the best is yet to come for us, for all you, you know, diehard, uh, like me, uranium bulls, you know, who've been, you know, uh, getting slapped around for the last 10 years in Fukushima. So I think this is finally, uh, the major shift that we're looking for. And I think we're all, we're well positioned to be a part of someone's portfolio who wants a five or 10 bag or 15 bagger versus moving up a little bit here with your aim. That's all that's going to happen. If you've got a project drilled out, you can put all the lipstick you want on it, put all the makeup you want on it, but only move up with the price of uranium or unless there's a takeover, but you have make one with our, how many holes we'll have next year. You know, I'm guessing 30, 40, if not 50, if one of them hit high grade, those stock will be 50 cents to a dollar. So you, you don't get many shots like that. And we're, it has the same technical team. If you know, real estate is location, location, that's true in uranium, but it's also people, people, people. Ray, and these guys were successful in diamonds and they found Waterbury and here. So you want to, you want to be with a team that can handle um, different kinds of settings and be well prepared. And you already do that during a bear market. You don't do that during a bull market. You've got to have the vision like Ray and Ross and the boys do. They were buying these projects, looking at them, getting ready in really crappy times. Right, right, okay. Good, thanks for the comments, sir. Um, let's let's shift gears here a little bit, look at some of the projects that you have. Uh, let's start with PLN. Is this something you consider your flagship? And if, if so, is it something you want to continue work on? Or is it time to go out and find the significant JV partner to start spending their money? Well, if somebody came to me and gave me the right price, absolutely. You know, I would do what's best for shareholders. Um, but I think a lot of people are still wondering if this is, the market's real, so they're worried about chewing off something big. But it's absolutely our flagship. We have over 14 million spent on it. Um, I think the word uh, Ross often uses is smoke versus fire. Well, we've got smoke here. Um, I saw some company put out, you know, X, you know, uh, counts per second over. We have have double that. Um, so we've already got a sniff. Maybe you can talk a bit about that sniff that we found and why we think there's more there, right? Yeah, well, you said it. It was a, it was seven and a half meter intercept, and uh, the peak there was fourteen fifty CPS. That's significant. I mean, you know, that 
with uranium deposits in the Athabasca, you can put a hole, a drill hole can be right, be very close, meters away from the high grade, and there'll be very little radioactivity. Counts per second won't be there. There's just, it's subtle. You're in the deposit or you're not. And so getting those signs in the drilling that we've done is, is it's, it's exciting. It's actually totally exciting stuff. It speaks to the system being a pregnant system that's when the smoke is there, follow up drilling. We, in, our, in the past for us, follow up drilling has led to discovery. So yeah, that A1 conductor, is a, is, it's got all the right signs. We know that the right fluids were there, hydrothermals were, fluids were there. We know it's brought in uranium. Now the question is, is there a deposit along that trend? Um, and yeah, it's, it's, got, it, it's got all the ingredients. That's, that is what it looks like just before a discovery. Right. I don't know if we're gonna make it, but it doesn't get better than that. Okay, and you're talking about this A1 trend, and you know I think most conductors on the PLN trend appear north south. Uh, do you think that the dominant uranium bearing corridors will follow a similar direction, or might there be cross cutting features, uh, you know, parallel to Patterson Lake South that are worth part of? Absolutely, I I particularly like the Broach Lake trend. I, and, okay, and then I can tell you something else that's really cool about PLS. If, I mean, you have to imagine, I showed you the A1 trend on the west side of the property. Just east of that, there was a thing called the A4 conductor. On that A4 conductor, the sandstone was 300 meters thicker than at A1. That speaks to a huge fault with, with that's a lot of throw on the fault. That's a very major structure that's, that heads where? Down and cross cuts. It goes right near the Broach Lake, cross cuts the end of the Bro Lake, Broach Lake trend and hits the Patterson Lake corridor near Arrow. We think that stands to be a really significant cross cutting structure. Um, and where we're gonna first test the Broach Lake conductor is right at that cross fault. So no, I think the beauty of the PLS property is we know that to the North, you've got Clough Lake and uh, and south of it, those deposits are along a north-south conductive trend. And just seven kilometers south of the property, we know that there's northeast trending structures that have uraniferous hydrothermal fluids that have traveled along them and, and, and precipitated large uranium deposits. Both of those things are potential on the PLN property. They're both there. And, they, and you know, there's several of those trends have we've never put drill holes into them. You know, they, we tested the A1. All, several of the broach lakes never had a drill hole into it. End conductors never had a drill hole into it. And we're about to do that. So we're, and they, yeah, they, some of them are north south, some of them are northeast, and they both have potential. Right. Okay. You, you mentioned the sandstone gets thicker in the west. Um, and I imagine sandstone gets pretty thick to the north as well. Uh, you know, as you get deeper into the basin, you know, does ha, have these limited previous drilling in these areas? That ah, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of the historic drilling that's been done on PLN, there's been some, the holes never made it to the unconformity. They were lost in sandstone because it's really difficult drilling. And it's interesting that Bryson, yeah, we, who Dev said, we grew up together with Bryson. When they started out, they had two drills. They've been with us the whole time. Bryson has managed to get, they don't, they haven't lost the holes. We, they drilled very successfully where previous operators were losing holes. So it's, and it's not just the thickness of the sandstone. It's the particular, it's that it's sand more than sandstone. It's just the particular nature of the overburden and the, and the, and the surface materials there that makes the drilling tough. Bryson can get through, has been getting through. Uh, yeah, to the north, there's, yeah, it gets thicker. Where the end conductor is, there's it's something, it's gonna be something like four or 500 meters of sandstone. Right. Uh, you know, at A1, it's only hundred meters of sandstone and to the east of that, it's 300. So there, it's variable sandstone thickness, uh, but it's nothing that's gonna make the drilling difficult. We don't, we fully expect to be able to drill those holes without, you know, successfully. Okay. Just from past experience. 
So I have a question on Hardy Bay as well. Has there been much historical work completed around the high grade boulders in that area? And well, are those basement rocks and therefore the source of them must be outside of the Athabasca Basin itself? Well, Ray will tell you that Cameco drilled a lot there, but they were looking for unconformity deposit. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah, look, it's a bit complicated, but if I can try and the boulders themselves that are on that island, there's pitch blend, uranium attached to sandstone boulders in that boulder train, and also some boulders were found with basement rocks and pitch blend attached to them. So what El Dorado concluded is that the ice must, those boulders must have been at the top of bedrock for the ice to have scraped the bottom of the ice to have scraped them and put them on the island where they are now in linear trains. So they concluded that the, the source had to be straddle the sand, be at the very edge of the sandstone. So the part of the deposit that was scraped would be, have, be on the basement side, outside the basement, and part of that pot of uranium would be inside. That was what they concluded. And that's why when they drilled their holes, when they got to the edge of the basin, they, they didn't go any further. And what, so we think they had the right idea. Our work on that island by the same geomorphologist that went to the boulder train at PLS that I worked with, you know, in the diamond days, a geomorphologist, mm -hmm. fantastic yeah. geomorphologist. He told us that suggested that there's other sandstone outliers further to the Northeast beyond where El Dorado stopped. That's what that marine seismic survey that we did very sophisticated marine seismic survey was done specifically to fall, to see if those targets existed, sandstone outliers beyond the first edge of the basin. So that's what we think it was, the first edge, and that there'll be other little outliers of sandstone further up ice. So, you know, we think that the old timers had the right idea, but they just didn't go far enough. And we've done the, you know, the, it's, it's really, high quality geophysical surveys that have been done there that have generated the targets that we're going to follow up. Fair enough. But if you had your choice, your target would be basement hosted as opposed to sandstone hosted. Yeah, that's what we think it's going to be in the end. The fact that there was basement rocks that were mineralized on the island tells me that it that it's going to be a basement hosted deposit, at least part of it. And which means that it has the potential to be quite you know, has the potential to not just sit at the unconformity, but to now go down into the basement, who knows, you know, so that it stands to be, if we can discover the source, it stands to go well into the basement and have size potential for that reason and not to be eroded for that reason. Right, right. Okay, guys. So we're coming up to the top of the hour. Maybe just uh, one more question before we wrap up. So um, last year, most uranium explorers in the basin were impacted by a warm winter. So, you know, late start, early spring. Uh, do you guys plan to get working sooner this winter or do you have any ideas how you might be able to ensure a longer field season? You know, to well, that's back? kind of why we're clearing the ice, uh, sorry, the snow. The snow is uh, insulation and you won't get, you won't get thick ice right so that's why you clear the snow now and then you build up the ice you don't wait for mother nature to do it david uh so you just got to plan ahead uh for the worst case you hope for the best but you plan for the worst and that's why we're clearing the snow now and building up the ice as we speak yeah and we start clearing the snow when the ice is just thick enough to support skidoos and people and right away that and that's exactly what you said we've been there before when we were the only, Bryson was the only company drilling because they started clearing snow and building ice in December where other people waited too late. So yeah. by starting early, even in a warm year, well, in warm years in the past, we've still managed to get on the ice and drill. Yeah, I think everybody learned their lesson from last year. So, Okay, well, thank you very much, Deb and Ray from Fission 3.0 for speaking to us today. I'd like thank to thank you. everybody for tuning in. Uh, reminder, Red, so Red Cloud Securities will be back tomorrow afternoon. I will sit down with PanCon Resources. That's December 8th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you, thank guys. You, thank you, Red Cloud. Thank you, David. Thank you, Red Cloud. You're welcome, yes. guys.